Hi folks, this is Andy, the Analytical Preacher. Had a great question someone asked me. Since the devil must know, since the devil clearly believes that God is real, then why would he be destined for hell? That They actually said, I suspect that the devil has a stronger belief that God is real than I do, the person said. He said, because if Satan has seen God and he starts talking about Job chapter 1, then he knows that God is real. It's not just a belief in that sense, but he knows that God is real. Which again, he stated, might make his belief in God even stronger than mine. And so why would Satan be destined for hell? I absolutely love this question because the answer to the question cuts right to the heart of Christianity. It cuts right to the heart of the gospel message. The answer pivots on what we mean by the word believe. And we have to be careful in some cases, it may be that a Greek word that gets translated into an English word, remember, the Bible was written in Greek, the New Testament, I should say, was written in Greek. And so sometimes a Greek word in the New Testament gets translated into an English word, and the meaning is a little different, and so we have to sort of understand that. As often as not, the Bible will mean something specific by a word, which the Bible will also define. And so we look for the definition of words like faith and belief. We look for those words to be defined in Scripture itself. So we'll use the famous verses in John chapter 3 for this podcast, and we'll start off. Let me read John 3.16, but also read the couple of verses that come after John 3.16, because I suspect this is partly where the gentleman got his question from. So John 3.16, and 18 say this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And we get a clue here at the end of this verse 18. Whoever does not believe is condemned already, and we start to refine the definition of belief. It's not believing in the name of the only Son of God. And we'll touch on this in a second, but that's a more stronger legal statement than just saying, I have a belief, I have a mental conviction that something is so or that someone is real. It's more than just I have a mental understanding or a mental conviction about it. It's more of a strong legal term. I believe in the name of the only Son of God. The word that's getting translated believes, so whoever believes in him, whoever believes is not condemned. That word is the Greek word pistuo, pistuo, and it's related to the Greek word pistis, which often gets translated as either trust or gets translated as faith. So there's a lot of interplay between these, but this pistuo word often gets translated as belief. But again, it is more than just a mental conviction that something is real. It is biblically defined as a trust in the thing that you have the mental conviction about. It's really more specifically defined as entrusting oneself to this thing or this person or this idea in which you have this mental conviction. So if you believe that God is real, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you believe that, you pistuo that, then the Bible is saying you need to entrust yourself to that God, to that Jesus, which is, again, very similar to saying you need to believe in the name of the only Son of God. Think about it in terms of like we would say a power of attorney. I am giving this individual the control and the authority over my life. So I not only believe that God is there, I not only believe that Jesus was a real person, I not only believe that Jesus is God's Son and the Son of God, but I am entrusting myself to Jesus. I am acting on this mental conviction that I have and putting my trust in the name of 
the only Son of God, as John 3, 18 says. I am giving him power of attorney over my life. The Bible refers to it as making Christ Lord of my life. If you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, those types of concepts. And we really see this definition of believe, this entrusting, trusting in or entrusting yourself to definition. We really see that, uh, I'll say get polished up to a very high sheen. It gets polished to this ultimate high gloss still in John chapter 3. And again, we would expect the Bible to do this if it's going to give a word that's as powerful as believe. So whoever believes in the Son of God shall not perish, but have everlasting life or have eternal life. That's a classic key word. And so then we, of course, we would say we don't want to perish. We do want to have eternal life with God. So Whoever believes in Jesus has that. Then what does it mean to believe in Jesus? We would expect very shortly after that, that the Bible would help us to define that. It does, of course, in verse 18, it's believing in the name of the Son of God, knowing that you can put your trust in that person. And then in John 3, 36, we get, again, we polish any rough edge off when we polish this thing to a high gloss or a high sheen. John 3, 36 says this, whoever believes, pistuo, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Now John's going to contrast to define the word for us. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. Real quick side note, this is why it's important sometimes to have a really accurate translation of the Greek New Testament into English because some Bibles will just say there, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, whoever does not believe the Son shall not see life. But that's not actually what John wrote in the Greek. And so translations such as the English Standard Version, the ESV, or the New American Standard Bible, the NASB, are for when you're really doing word studies like this, those are the best Bibles to use because they're the best word-for-word -word translation of those Greek manuscripts into English. So what is this saying? It's not contrasting belief with what we would call unbelief. It contrasts biblical belief with this idea of obedience. I'm not going to read the verses, but in Hebrews chapter 3, we see that exact same contrast made. The writer of Hebrews is talking about the Hebrew children when Moses brought them out of slavery, and he talks about that they did or didn't believe, and it was shown by the fact that they did or didn't obey. And so in the Bible, the contrast to belief is not unbelief, but the opposite of belief is disobedience. And the word that gets translated here as whoever does not obey is not dispistuo with a not or an un in front of it. It's actually a different word, apateo. So it's a totally different word. So John is saying, I'm going to use the word pistuo here, which to some could be read as just this mental conviction that something must be true but I'm going to contrast it with a different word that talks about, this word means, if you look in a dictionary, this word means to refuse obedience or to refuse to comply with something because the belief isn't there or because the belief isn't strong enough, etc. And so John is really intentionally, through the, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, He's defining this word belief for us. And so the answer to the question is simply this. The devil does know that God is there. The devil does know that God is real. The devil does know that God is eternal. The devil does know that Jesus is God's Christ, our Messiah. The devil does know that Jesus is God's Son. The devil does know that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, third person of the Godhead. But what the devil says is, I refuse to place my trust in God. I refuse to place my trust in God to make this belief, this knowledge that God is real. I refuse to make it actionable in my life by complying with God, by being obedient to the will of Christ. Jesus' half-brother, James, 
wrote a book in the New Testament that goes by his name. And in James chapter 2, 18 to 20, James writes this, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? James is getting at this same point, and he's using very similar words here to what we talked about before. This word pistis here, and he is going, again, it's not just a belief, it's not just a mental understanding, but there's got to be some action involved with it. Look, the devil knows, the devil has a faith that God is real and that God is there. What the devil won't do, the reason the devil and the demons shudder is because they haven't been willing to give control. Jesus is not their Lord, no matter how real they know that he is. So for us to say that we are Christians, for us to say that God has gifted us eternal life in Jesus Christ because we believe in Jesus Christ, for us to say that, we really have to say we are not just believing that God exists, but we're entrusting our lives to Christ. We're entrusting our salvation to Christ. What is God asking us to do? You don't have to obey everything that's written in the entire Bible. None of us are capable of doing that. That's why the Bible speaks about grace. That's why Christ died on the cross on our behalf. But what you do have to say is, my belief in God is the type of belief. My faith in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross is the type of faith that causes me to entrust myself, that causes me to give the lordship and direction of my life over to Jesus Christ. So when it says those who believe will have eternal life, but those who disobey, the wrath of God remains on them. Disobey what? It's disobey this basic idea that runs through scripture that what Christ is calling you to do is one, confess yourself as a sinner. Acknowledge that you have broken God's laws and that God's laws are right. And so for you to break them is, the Bible calls it sin or lawlessness. So admit that you are a lawless sinner who has broken God's law. And then you, Jesus says, repent. He told his disciples after he was raised from the dead in Luke 24, preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins in my name. I can't repent from my sins unless I'm willing to confess that I'm a sinner. Once I admit that I'm a sinner, did you hit your sister with that? Yes, I did hit my sister with that. Are you going to do it again? Yes, mommy, as soon as you turn around. Okay, that's not repentance. That's just the confession part. So Jesus is saying, I need you to say, you know that breaking God's law is wrong. And then I need you to say, because you know it's wrong, because you're entrusting your life to me, because you have a saving faith or a saving belief, you're going to seek to turn away from those sins. You're going to seek to repent and turn back to God with faith in Christ. And so we just need to know that because we've broken God's laws, there's a debt, there's a payment that is due. There's a fine that the judge is going to want to exact and that Jesus Christ made that payment. And we have full faith that Christ has paid for our sins. And what we need to do is repent of our sins and, and by faith accept that Jesus Christ paid those sins for us. Romans 10 tells us that we need to believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead because that was essentially God's way of saying, I accept the payment on the cross. So why would I have faith that what Christ did on the cross paid for my sins? Because God showed acceptance of that payment by raising Jesus from the dead. So I need to believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then I need to be baptized by immersion in Jesus's name. That's one way that I show that I have faith in the name of the only son of God as I am baptized by immersion into his name. And that baptism all the way under water represents me dying to sin, being buried, and then being raised to new life in Christ. And so again, none of us can be perfect when the Bible says those who do not obey, the wrath of God remains on them. 
It is not saying in that case that obedience means obedience to every single word written in the Old and the New Testament. It doesn't mean that at all. What Christ is calling us to do is say, I am in fact a sinner. I know I need to walk away from those sins. I do entrust my life to Christ. I do put my faith in the name of the only Son of God. I know that he's paid for my sins. I believe that God has accepted the payment for those sins because he raised Jesus from the dead. And now I am anxious and eager to be baptized by immersion to commit myself fully and publicly to this Christian life. Submit myself publicly and fully to this name of the only Son of God. And on the flip side of that coin, Why will Satan, if he knows for a fact that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are real, if Satan knows that Jesus died on the cross, if Satan knows for a fact that Jesus rose from the dead, why would Satan then be destined for hell? And it's as simple as this, because he doesn't put his trust in Christ. He won't entrust his life to God, even though he knows God is real. He does not want to through pride. He does not want to give control of his life to Jesus. He does not want to entrust himself to Jesus's leadership. So though he knows he is real, he will not entrust himself to the name of the only son of God, which is therefore disobedience to God. And John 3.16 certainly says those who believe will have eternal life. But John 3.36 says, But not believing means not obeying these things about entrusting your name. And for those people, as for Satan, the wrath of God will remain on them. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this is Andy.